Good morning. Today is Sunday, March 20th, 2022. This coming Shabbos, which is the Parsha of Shemini, we also have a special Torah reading, a Torah reading that is cryptic, that is mysterious, but also with a lot to teach us if we learn how to apply it to ourselves. And the subject is para aduma, the red heifer. So this is a ritual that existed during the time when the Beit HaMikdash, the Holy Temple, was standing in Jerusalem. And it was a kind of a, I won't use the word sacrifice, but a procedure involving an animal. It was burned to ashes. The ashes were added to water. And if a person had come into contact with a dead body, they were tame, they were ritually impure, they would be able to appear before a Kohen on the third day and on the seventh day and to be sprinkled by the Kohen with this water. And after going through this seven-day ritual, then they would remove the status of being tame and they would be able to be tahar. They would be ritually pure. So, it certainly sounds like a very, again, mysterious ritual, sacrifices, ritual impurity, things that we don't really seem to understand so well, which makes it all the more surprising the comment that we find in the Zohar. Zohar is the main text of Jewish mysticism. And the Zohar says, Sod para aduma, the secret behind this mysterious ritual is Ahavas Yisrael, the love that one Jew has for another. Seems very, very strange. Because first of all, Paraduma is the classic example of that category of laws known to us as a chok, a law that does not seem to have logical basis. We can't figure out why we're doing this, what the logic of this red heifer ceremony is. So in what possible way can you say that it's connected to ethics, that the secret of this is the love that we are to have for every other Jew? I want to share with you the approach very briefly this morning of the Sfas Emes, one of the great Hasidic masters. In this book of the Torah, the book of Ayikra that we're reading now, the, the Greek term that we often use for it is Leviticus, the laws of the Levites and the priests. It's the priestly section. And it teaches a lot about this subject of Tumah, ritual purity, and tahara, ritual impurity. For example, the highest level of impurity is if a person comes into contact with a dead body. Now, what's important to understand and is very often misunderstood is that this concept, this structure of tuma, ritual pure, impurity, tahara, ritual purity, there is no moral layer to it. It is a spiritual status. There are no moral consequences. It's neither good nor bad to come into contact with a dead body. It happens for various reasons. There is no prohibition against entering a state of tumma, of ritual impurity. Every time we go to a funeral, we are voluntarily becoming ritually impure by contact with the dead body. Every time we go to a cemetery, and that's a mitzvah. We're fulfilling a mitzvah. So there's no moral problem with being ritually impure. The only consequence is, which is not even so relevant to us today, is that we are not allowed to eat those foods 
that are carbonos sacrifices during the time when the Beis Amigdash is standing. Okay, we don't have carbonos today, so it's not practically relevant to us. But if there would be sacrifices, we would not be allowed to eat them in a state of ritual impurity. And also, we are not allowed to enter the area of the Beit HaMikdash, of the Holy Temple in Jerusalem, because it's holy, spiritually holy. We are ritually impure. We do not have this mechanism of the red heifer, the Paraduma today. We are told that when Mashiach comes, we will have it again, but today we do not have it. And that's why we are not supposed to walk on the area of what is called today the Temple Mount. Yes, I know that this is a large discussion. There are many religious Jews that do so. It's a long discussion for another time. But the bottom line, the normative opinion, the opinion of the chief rabbis, the opinion of all of the greatest halakhic authorities of our time, is that since we are tame, ritually impure, and we do not have a way to fix that because there is no paraduma, we are not allowed to walk on the top of that mountain, the other side of the Kotel in Jerusalem, uh, because that is a place of purity, and we do not have that purity. So, when the Beis Amigdash was standing, there was this procedure of the Paraduma, which is the section that we read from the Torah this Shabbos, to create or to return the state of purity to every single Jew, and again, it's a seven-day ceremony. And on the third day and the seventh day, the person be appears before a Kohen. And the Kohen will take some water into which some of the ashes of this red heifer were sprinkled. And this water will be sprinkled on the person who comes before them. And at the end of the seventh day, the person immerses in a mikvah. And they're tahar, they're pure. They're allowed to enter the base of Migdash. They're allowed to eat from a carbon. The reason that we read this Torah portion this Shabbos is a reminder. Pesach is coming in just about three weeks from this Shabbos. And if the base of Migdash would be standing, and if we would want to offer the carbon Pesach, the Paschal offering, which means that we would, number one, be in the courtyard of the Beis Amidish, and number two, we would want to participate, part, partake of a carbon, a sacrifice that had been offered that will be the main part of our Seder meal, Pesach is coming. And we have to make sure that we are tahar, ritually pure. So if whatever happened during the previous year caused us to be tame, now's the time to take care of it. It's a reminder. You have to get ready for Pesach. And it's a reminder to get ready to pay for Pesach, not just to buy your matzah, not just to buy your new clothes, not just to get ready starting to clean your house, but also to start with the spiritual preparations of what will be necessary for you to spiritually be able to partake and, and participate in, in the Pesach Seder this year. That's why we read this parsha this Shabbos. But there's one group of Jews for whom becoming Tame ritually impure is more than just an inconvenience requiring a seven-day ceremony in order to overcome. For a Kohen, a person who is from the family originating, originating with Aharon, for a Kohen, one of our priests, it is a sin. A Kohen is prohibited to come into the category of being Tame, because a Kohen's entire identity is to serve as a priest in the Beis HaMikdash, in the Holy Temple. And that is not allowed when that person is Tame. Even today, this prohibition applies to a Kohen today, that's the reason for the prohibition that a Kohen has against entering a cemetery or attending a funeral. 
unless it is for, God forbid, an immediate family relative, in which case the prohibition is waived. But for any other circumstance, there exists even today a prohibition of a Kohen doing something that causes him to become ritually impure. For us, who are not a Kohen, there's no moral issue. There's no sacrifice. But for a Kohen, it's a sin. But even more than being a sin, for a Kohen to become Tame, while the Beis Amigdash is standing, is to be cut off completely from his source of livelihood, from his means of support. How does a Kohen support himself and his family? Through working in the Beis Hamikdash, through receiving the gifts that the Jewish people are required to give to the Kohen, like Truma, the first fruits. But all of those things must be enjoyed when the Kohen is in a state of Tuhara, purity. If the Kohen is Tame, he has nothing to eat. He has nothing to feed his family. It costs the Kohen to become tummy. And because of this, there is a confounding Pusik, one of the deep mysteries of this entire subject. Because the Torah says, in the portion that we will read this Shabbos, in describing the procedure for the Kohen of creating and preparing and doing the sprinkling for anyone who comes to ask that needs ritual purification, the Torah says, the Tamei HaKohen Ad HaOrev. The Kohen becomes Tamei. The Kohen who officiates at this ceremony that allows everybody else to become ritually pure, he becomes tame, he becomes impure. So this question is a problem on two levels. Number one, it's a logical problem. And this problem, by the way, you should know, is unanswered. Even the greatest scholars... Shlomo HaMelech, King Solomon, said about himself, I am the wisest of all men, and I can't figure out the answer to this question. How is it possible that a process that is intended to purify causes impurification to the one who does it? If anything, he should be the most purified because not only is he purifying himself, he's purifying others. He should be the most purified. And yet the Torah says, the Kohen who officiates becomes impure. Okay, that's a philosophical conundrum. I don't have an answer to that. But the second problem is, look at the sacrifice that is needed from this Kohen in order to create this process, which is needed by the entire Jewish people, without the Kohen officiating at this ceremony, no Jewish person is going to be able to come into the base of Migdash. No Jewish person is going to be able to partake of a carbon. No Jewish person during the time when the base of Migdash is standing will be able to participate in the Pesach Seder. And in order to accomplish this, the Kohen sacrifices his own needs and sacrifices what is his most basic personal identity as a person who is ritually pure and he gives up temporarily his livelihood. And the Kohen says... I am willing. By participating in the Paraduma, the Kohen makes a statement, I am willing to give up something that is substantial for my people to benefit. I'm willing to do this despite its consequences for me. 
because it benefits others. One of the great Hasidic Rebbe's once said, if you want to raise a man out of the mud, you have to go all the way down yourself into the mud and then pull him and yourself out into the light. How many of us are willing to do that? How many of us are willing to dirty ourselves to not only inconvenience ourselves, but to put our own needs on hold in order to save another Jew. I'm sure you know the stories of Reb Shlomo Karlbach, who would travel before anybody else to the former Soviet Union to visit with Jews who had been so lost from their religion for so many years due to the Soviet the ideology. And as you know, and as he and many others did, he would smuggle in with him Jewish books and Jewish objects like tefillin and a talis and a chumash to give these thirsting Jews, Russian Jews thirsting for Judaism, for Torah, the tools to be able to resurrect their religious lives. And we know ultimately the tremendous success of these trips and many, many others like them. Once it happened that Shlomo was on a trip and it was near the end of the trip and he had given away everything he had, all the pairs of tefillin he had brought, all the chumashim, all the prayer books, all the talesim, all the yarmulkes, he'd given everything away. And he was about to go home. And just then, a young Jewish boy knocked on his door. And he begged him, Please, I want a pair of tefillin. I want to be able to put on tefillin. And if you leave, I'll never have the chance. I want to be able to wear a kippah. If you leave, I will never be able to have the chance to do so. So Shlomo took his own pair of tefillin, his own personal tefillin, which had been his since his bar mitzvah. They had belonged to his father. They were a family heirloom. He never parted with them. But he gave them away to this young boy. And he didn't have an extra kippah. So he took off his own kippah and he gave it to this boy. And then he went to the airport. He went to the airport. Of course, he had a beard and payas, but he was not wearing a kippah. And he finally reached the airport in Austria where there were other Jews walking around. And he went over to another Jew, a religious Jew. And he said to him, Rabid, please, would you let me borrow your tefillin for a few minutes? I didn't have a chance to put on tefillin today because he had given them away. I didn't have a chance to put on tefillin. And this other Jew did not understand. This other Jew was not a Jew who thought about what he could do for another Jew at every moment. He looked at this strange person, Shlomo Karbach, who wanted tefillin, but he wasn't even wearing a kippah. He wasn't even wearing a yarmulke. And this Jew, in a rather haughty manner, said to him, Listen, fellow, before you start putting on tefillin, go put a yarmulke on your head. That was a lot of Shlomo's life. That he gave away what he had to others. And even if it made him look like an irreligious Jew, he sacrificed that. He sacrificed his own dignity in order to help another Jew. And he realized to himself that he had again been misjudged by this so-called religious Jew, but a Jew who really did not have any feeling of empathy within him. And Shlomo said to himself, because he didn't want to embarrass the other fellow. He said, my friend, but he said it to himself, 
one day you should only merit the holy yarmulke that I now have on my head because I gave it to another Jew without which he would never have one. That's what the Zohar means. The sowed of Paraduma, the secret of this mysterious ritual ceremony, the secret is Ahavas Yisrael, is the love that one feels for another Jew. To say you love someone is easy. The real question is what are you willing to sacrifice for them? The Kohen, in participating in the ceremony that we will describe in the Torah this week, was willing to sacrifice, was willing to give up not only his identity as a Kohen, but his means of supporting himself and his family just to be able to help another Jew be able to observe Pesach properly. When we read about the Paradum of the Shabbos, it should remind us that Pesach is coming. Yes, Pesach is coming in just over three weeks. And it should remind us of all the different preparations that we have to start making. And we're going to talk more about those preparations later this week. And again, not only the physical, mundane, material preparations, but the spiritual preparations as well to get ready for a meaningful Pesach and a meaningful Seder. We're going to discuss this together. But when we hear the Paraduma being read this Shabbos, the real question we have to ask ourselves, like that Kohen had to ask himself, what am I willing to sacrifice to demonstrate the love that I have for others? The only way to spiritually prepare for Pesach and the only way to spiritually come closer to God is through selflessness to others. What are you willing to give up for someone else? My friends, I want to wish you a great day and I look forward to seeing all of you soon in person.